the first thing I did was look at your reviews because I wanted to see what am I getting into over here? And you had phenomenal reviews. How does this happen? Because we care about every single one of them. Now, it's not perfect, man. I'm selling a 10 year old car with 150,000 miles. Like it will blow up. It will. Now, I hope that's not today or tomorrow or the next day or three or 12 months from now. But like I didn't manufacture that Chevy Equinox. I wasn't high and drunk when I decided let's build a Traverse. Like, come on, like some of the worst cars in the world. But yet I'm somehow responsible for this car that it should like never break, never blow up, never have a hiccup. So those things are going to happen. It's how you address them. Right. And so, yes, we do get bad reviews. Yes, people aren't happy with it. But we reach out to every single one of them and say, hey, man, what can we do? You know, we can take the car back. We never put money over reputation. You don't like it. Bring it back. You know, like I I'm not going to fight you on that. I don't want to have this kind of relationship. We're going to be seeing each other for 36 months on this car loan. I don't want you to regret it or not be happy to come back and talk to us. So let's just let's part ways now. Well said and a reason why you have such good reviews. By the way, who reaches out to the customer? Is that something you do, the GM? Like, talk to me about that. I, I used to do it and I had hair back then and now I stopped because I lost all my hair. Adrian, my number one guy, he's, and, and George, my number two, they're just so good with people, man. And that part of being in this industry, we I talk about it so much, is scaling to the point where you can start to add layers of people in between you and the customer because it's a lot of work and it's, super stressful. And yesterday we have a lady in here yelling and screaming about her piece of crap car and you sold me a lemon and this, 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 and they just want to be heard, right? They want they want to be heard. Yeah. Like sit them down and talk to them and let's come, let's figure it out. What happened? Well, you know, you put 30,000 miles on it in a year because you're driving DoorDash. Yeah. Your Nissan Cube's not built for that. Like, I love it. The Nissan Cube sold. Oh, don't, don't get me started, man. Don't get me started. It's uh. did, did but did she do oil changes? Be honest. Did she do oil? Changes. Oh, of course not, man. And she and, and we have a forever warranty. And it's like, no, it's not. It doesn't cover everything forever. And actually driving DoorDash and Uber and Lyft, that voids your finance contract. A lot of people don't know that using it for commercial purposes, that's a big no, no. So, so, so what do you do? So what do you do if you want to drive for Uber and Lyft? How do you buy that car? You know, a lot of people are getting away with it. It's a whole different situation if you disclose that to your finance company or you need to go through one of Uber or Lyft's finance because it's different, right? You're depreciating that car three times faster than it should be. And I'm cool with it. Let's do it. I'll help you get a car for Lyft, but you need to know it's not going to be a $300 a month payment. It's going to be $900 a month because you only have a year left before this thing is used up. And that's how the buy here, pay here world, especially lease here, pay here. Like when you talk to Tim Lawrence from lease here, pay here capital, like that's all about an asset. Like this little VIN number that's on the front of that car. I need that thing to go for 36, 48, 52 months with one customer, two customer, three customers. I don't know how many customers it's going to take, but when I acquire that VIN, I need that sucker to go for 48 months, right? Because it's got to pay me back. Months, the minimum you target. You mentioned that earlier in the podcast. Why is that the target? You know, we try to target 30. Uh, it's harder now with cost of cars. I definitely say our average is more in that like 36, 38 area. It's interest and time. So sure, I could give you a 60 month loan on something, but guess what? With the interest rates that I have to charge you, you're going to pay twice as much in interest as you do for the darn car. And I just can't do that. Right. So we find the balance between term interest rate and what they can afford. Right. Those are kind of the three pieces to the puzzle. But what happens at 36 months? Is that your payback period? Is that your break even period? No, 36 is just just I don't think the car is going to last any longer than that. You know, like. And the oh. customer is happy with the car longer than that. So most data shows that the customers, I mean, they're done with the car after 24 months. Like they need a new car. They're, they're sick of it. It's starting to have repair stuff. Maybe your miles are getting up higher than they're comfortable with. So we do like to trade people out. I mean, I can trade you out at any time. I'll trade you out tomorrow, right? We just want you to be in a car that you love and that you're going to pay every single month like awkward. What's your break even period on average? So typically we, we run like 18 to 19 months, depending on down payment and the ability. Sometimes we'll drag people out a little bit longer than that. But I say that and I probably mean closer to like the 24, like just with the affordability issue, down payments, you know, we'll, we'll offer a deferral if somebody needs it, they're having a hard time. We typically do a lot of that in December because it's just, dude, I can't make my car payment end by Christmas. So 18 months break even. If you target 36 months, the rest is pretty much you're in the black. It's profitable at that point, as long as the customer keeps it. Yeah, you could look at it that way. Yeah, you'd say, hey, I need, I need $500 for 18 months. 
And then I'm going to, you know, hopefully at that point, I'm starting to earn some profit and a little bit of interest by that point, right? Or, you know, essentially that's when my profit and interest comes into play for sure. You mentioned you're selling these cars for average sales price around $10,000. Where are you finding these cars? I mean, where are you sourcing your vehicles nowadays? That's really difficult to find. Yeah, I buy 70% of our stuff from Mannheim, OBE. I haven't stepped foot in an auction in probably five years. I don't like inlaying bidding. If I go down there and I inspect 50 cars, I might have five on my buy list. And then out of those five, everybody else wants those cars too. So I'm bidding against other experts to try to get the car that it's just inlaying. I don't know, man, drives me crazy. So I'm constantly on OBE. I'm constantly on back lots. Uh, we do a lot of buying from the public. So we have a whole public outreach. When you say, when you say I'm constantly on back lots, are you referring to like open lane? Yeah, whatever they call it now. Yeah, just like always on looking at what's for sale. I, I wasn't sure if you literally meant, I, I wasn't sure if you literally meant like. Like in their back uh, lot. We used to buy a lot directly from the new car stores here. And the problem with that is you get what they have. And that to me just doesn't make sense, man. I don't want to just have to take all five of these cars because I want the one. I don't want to have to take. So I need a big net because I only have 10 makes and models that I'll buy, right? I've literally, we've narrowed it down to the 10 that we want to mess with and that we think have the best longevity. So I, I don't need to go down there and take in everything and look at 500 cars on a Friday. Like there's 10 that I might go after. And if it's the right make and model, I'll pay what I have to get to get it here because I know it's going to run the note. A bit of a different question, but how has your business changed since the pandemic and, you know, I looking through some of the notes we had prepared beforehand, right? Obviously high rates, cars are more expensive, repairs are more expensive, delinquencies are rising, charge offs, right? You're the lender, you are the retailer. How, like what is, you know, what's going through your head nowadays? What are the biggest concerns in your mind when you think about the car industry, the car market and your business? business as a, you know, for the future. For me, and I would say for all dealers of my size, small one, two location guys, the interest, um, the flooring lines uh, are going to eat some dealers alive, right? If they haven't already, and a, a few have, right? They've, they've already been eaten alive by interest on flooring lines, curtailments, flooring lines being pulled, uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul, getting out of covenants with titles, things like that. From our standpoint, I'm, I'm pretty safe. I'm in a very, very low leverage on my portfolio, so I can weather there's some storms. That's the advantage of being a buy here, pay here dealer, right? Like it's going to get rough for us and our delinquencies have gone up. Our voluntary surrenders have gone up. Uh, it's hard for customers that go from having two jobs or a job and a half and now they get cut back to one job or they get their hours cut back at the job they had. So things are tighter and, and and everything costs more. So they're like, dude, what I was making used to cover my bills and now it doesn't. So something's got to give. And a lot of times it's the second car, the third car, uh, maybe downsizing a payment. Um, so that's really, 2005, we had a hard time, right? Like there was a lot of like resetting that people had to do. And that was painful for us as a buy here, pay here. It's the ride to the bottom that hurts. It's good at the bottom. I'll be honest, man. Like being a buy here, pay here in 08, 2010, it's great. I look forward to when all these banks just get out of the space, man, doing crazy loans to people that $700 payment on a brand new Mustang to someone that barely makes $1,200 a month. Like you, you, we heard the stories during COVID of just crazy car payments happening and these lenders that were just doors wide open, like stop it. So now they're taking their lumps. They're starting to tighten up, right? I think is that pretty much the consensus that lending is getting harder and harder. Approvals are getting. Yeah, it's been, it's been consistently, it's consistently gotten hot harder over the last 18 months, you know, at the minimum, there was definitely, you know, there were, there were spikes where, you know, lenders tightened faster at different periods, but I would say consistently it's gotten harder. There, and actually, well, I would say on the opposite end, there've also been some periods of light loosening in between. Uh, I'll just, you know, data and all that stuff is pretty readily available. I post about it all the time, but yes, bottom line, it has gotten tougher. Yes. It's getting a little tighter. And what happens is that pushes the credit scale down, right? So whereas during COVID and some of the times after, and our customers were just no scores, you know, like just real, real tough. But as those banks tighten, it just starts to get, you know, good people with bad credit, like good people. Hey, I had to let a house go. I had to let a car go. I had to let a side by side or a boat or a trailer go back to the bank, killed my credit score. And now I got to come to you guys, right? I got to get out of that payment and I need to come to you guys and get a 25th Honda Accord for 400 a month, right? So there's a bit of humbling, but for us, it's really good when it kind of hits the bottom and you've got good people that just want to get oars and get back on track.